I hope you all I hope you're all enjoying your lunch. And I, I promise you, um, we're of the view that there was a lot of things to chew on all, uh, all morning. And so uh, the three of us up here are not going to um, complicate your digestive systems. There can be plenty more uh, after lunch. But we're here for a, a very um, happy occasion. Um, and I, I just want to say that I, I want to thank uh, all of you for coming, I, and, and we'll say some more uh, at the end. Um, but I, I think the, the panels have really been uh, outstanding, uh, as have the plenaries. And to reflect the, the breadth of what we're working on, a lot of times people think of it as the nonproliferation conference, which is what it used to be. Um, but we've tried to turn it into the nuclear policy conference uh, so that it extends from nuclear industry, disarmament, deterrence, nonproliferation, the whole gamut. And I think we've, uh, we've seen that uh, thus far, and we'll see it uh, in the afternoon. So I, again, I want to uh, thank you. Um, when we were beginning to plan the conference a number of months ago, actually not in the beginning, we, we began it many more months than that, but when we were in the middle of planning about it, um, we were sitting around in our, in our office, and I think one of us um, mused, it might have been me, um, damn, I'm really going to miss Therese. And so for those of you uh, who know Therese Del Pesce or who knew Therese Del Pesce, uh, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. For those of you um, who didn't have the pleasure or at least the experience of, of, of meeting Therese and encountering uh, Therese. Um, she was the director uh, of strategic studies at the French Atomic Energy Commission. Uh, she had been a kind of a, 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 a central figure in, in these kind of gatherings in the international kind of nuclear policy community uh, for a number of decades. Um, she was a philosopher by training and, and really by avocation uh, as, as well. Um, and a very interesting writer. And she was the kind of person that at meetings like this, everybody would kind of be waiting to, to see one of her moments of kind of penetrating questioning or outrage or counting with her fingers uh, like that. In any case, for those of you who don't uh, know, Therese died about 14 months ago. Um, she was 63, but that's way uh, too early, and especially uh, you know, with somebody who seemed as, uh, as, as invincible and, and grand as she. So anyway, we're sitting in our office and thinking, it's just not going to be the same uh, without Therese. And then we started, as one does in these kinds of things, saying, well, what was it about her? And, and we were batting it around. And it, it is kind of hard to pin down the qualities that made her so uh, important to us and so many in the field. She was exceptionally smart, but then a lot of people uh, in this field are really smart. Um, she asked fundamental and sometimes difficult questions that challenge tacit assumptions that a lot of us uh, had. So she was a really uh, creative provocateur. Um, she wasn't always right, uh, but she was always principled. She was very curious about human beings uh, as a species and then also a member as members of the particular culture. So she really studied people. And in fact, I don't know if everyone knows who, who knew her in the nuclear space, but in many ways, her, her, well, her three, the three books she cared most about that she wrote in the last less than 10 years of her life, uh, one, the Ensauvagement, which we published at Carnegie as the Savage Century. Uh, then she wrote a book more recently, The Call of the Shadow, The Power of the Irrational, which is a real psychological and historical study. And then the book that came out a couple of months before she died um, was The Man Without a Past, Freud and Historical Tragedy. So nuclear weapons really, that, nuclear policy was really her job, but her, what she really loved and cared about was trying to understand uh, human beings, and always with this drive, and you see it in the titles of these books, to, in a sense, to warn us, to, 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 to prompt us, to figure out how to prepare us and how to defeat people or states that would 
violently repress uh, other people on a horrific scale. She was, she was always a fighter um, to, to protect people from that kind of massive uh, danger. She was nonpartisan, uh, and she was utterly incorruptible, to a fault if that's possible, actually. Um, <laughs> the, um, she, she was really principled. Um, I don't mean that in a, anyway, um, that I, I mean that in, in every way except for the way you're laughing about. Um, she was a very important and dedicated uh, mentor to, to many uh, people here. And, and I think that kind of led us to think a next step. So as, as George says, we wanted to find some way of memorializing and remembering Therese. And it also occurred to us that this community, the nuclear policy community, has no way of recognizing those who have given really, truly outstanding service. And so um, the Carnegie Endowment has created the Therese Del Pesh Memorial Award, uh, which we at Carnegie intend to give up this and future conferences to honor somebody who has given truly outstanding service to the nuclear policy community. Um, the plaque has a, a motto, if you like, which we've adopted, which is integrity, creativity, amity, and humanity. And this year's winner embodies those um, four concepts um, very deeply. This year's winner has had an extraordinarily distinguished career as a public servant. He served in the US Armed Forces and as a senior official who has been confirmed by the Senate on no less than four occasions. But that's not the primary reason why we're giving him the award. This year's winner is also a leading defense intellectual who's written many important and notable papers uh, in the academic literature and reports for government. But again, that's not the primary reason why we're giving him this award. The primary reason we are giving him this award, if you'll forgive me for putting it this way, is although he's now just a few years past retirement age, uh, and by rights he really ought to be lying on a beach somewhere, uh, drinking pina coladas with his wife, uh, or maybe imposing on his children, uh, in fact, he probably ought to be doing anything other than thinking about nuclear weapons. But nonetheless, he is still spending an inordinate amount of time thinking about nuclear weapons and the issue of how to prevent war. He's doing so as a private citizen, uh, no longer part of any institution, not to put too fine a point on it, uh, that would remunerate him for thinking about this but yet he continues to give service to this community that is very much above and beyond. For many of us here today, I think at many stages of our careers, uh, regard him as a mentor. Uh, I think particularly about the work he's currently doing with the Project on Nuclear Issues, uh, uh, run by the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He's somebody who's not only willing to give words of advice, but also somebody who's willing to spend literally hours uh, helping turn our half-formed uh, thoughts and shaping them into real and coherent arguments. Uh, his criticism at such time, I think full and frank might be a reasonable term to describe them. This year's winner is also somebody who is astonishingly willing to devote massive amounts of time to attending meetings and conferences uh, and sharing uh, his wisdom and insight with all those present. His ability to think up creative policy ideas uh, is, is, is unparalleled. I'd also note in passing that not once has he ever asked me to buy him a business class ticket. <laughs> Although he's somebody who served presidents of both parties, he has been primarily associated with one political party, but is also a national security professional in the very, very best sense of the term. He's somebody who is completely nonpartisan, willing to take a good idea wherever it comes from, and willing to criticize a bad idea wherever it comes from. 
and let me assure you from first-hand experience. If he disagrees with you, he lets you know he disagrees with you. But even where he does disagree, he does so with a tremendous sense of humor that can enliven even the most dull and uninteresting meeting. Not that there are any that Carnegie ever organizes. In short, he's somebody who embodies uh, the, uh, the motto for the Therese del Pesce Award, uh, integrity, creativity, amity, and humanity. Uh, very many of you will know already exactly who I'm talking about. For those who don't, it's my tremendous pleasure and honor to announce that this year's winner is Ambassador Linton Brooks. Now, I'll, I'll just ask you to hold your applause for a second because you're going to have a chance to clap him when he comes up on stage in just one second. Um, we thought it was only appropriate to embarrass Linton a little bit more than we already have done, which he may not be enjoying, but we thoroughly are. Um, so to say a few more words before we actually present the award, Will Toby. Thank you. Uh, being loyal, I will embarrass him briefly. <laughs> I can think of no more appropriate recipient of the Dopesh Memorial Award than Linton Brooks, teacher, practitioner, and strategist of nuclear policy. My particular role is that, like many of you, I can testify personally to Linton's qualities as a teacher and mentor. On Ronald Reagan's NSC staff, I took every opportunity I could to go to his office and sit at his desk and learn about American and Soviet nuclear policy and hear a few sea stories. <laughs> Linton gave me a second education. 20 years later, at the National Nuclear Security Administration, surprisingly to me anyway, uh, the education continued. No one who has heard Linton swear in new members of the Senior Executive Service can be but moved by his eloquent expression of the nobility of public service. Everyone who worked for him understood the importance he attached to training and mentoring ne the next generation of public servants. And so it's a great pleasure to offer congratulations to Linton and his wife Barbara and daughter Katie on an honor well deserved, and to thank you for being such a wise and caring leader. Thank you all very much. Um, to receive an award from Carnegie, which has done so much over the years to foster understanding and collegiality among those of us who work for national security and international stability is a great honor. To have an award named after Therese presented to me is simply stunning. There are words that you find in dictionaries and you read definitions, but you don't fully understand them. It wasn't until I worked in the Department of Energy I really understood the word Byzantine. <laughs> and it wasn't until I met Therese that I understood the term force of nature <laughs> because she was and it is hugely flattering to think that I can be considered part of her legacy in any small way because she did so much and served as such a model. There is one thing that has been said 
that I want to push back on a little bit. Uh, it's certainly true I have spent a fair amount of time trying to help the next generation, um, which in my case is now <laughs> including most of the human race, but <laughs> trying to help the next generation move uh, forward. Uh, but I'm bothered by the fact that people think that that's unusual. Because it seems to me that should be an inherent part of everything everybody in this room does. Most of us have spent our lives working for different aspects and working on different approaches of improving national security for our countries and improving international stability and the prevention of conflict. And we're all going to die. I mean, and somebody's going to have to keep doing that. And so it seems to me stunning that there should be anybody who isn't spending time mentoring the next generation because that is our legacy. And so those of you who are not, I urge you to do that. And when you do, you will find something that I have found, uh, which is, you know, there's this myth that the more mature uh, are supposed to look askance at the younger generation. And that's just nonsense. That's just nonsense. You know, many of you are sort of right around where I am. And let me tell you, the people that we are seeing in their early careers now, we could not have held a candle to when we started. And uh, helping them is, is a great honor. So I thank you very much for the award. I thank Carnegie for the award. Um, I thank Will for showing up with no discernible purpose other than, <laughs> other than to remind me that we did start a quarter of a century ago. Seems shorter. Uh, but I do want to thank you very much. And I want you to think not about who this award is given to, but about who it's named for and what she symbolized, most particularly this aura of principle and intellectual integrity and just fierce devotion to a cause. Because what we are doing is important enough so that that should be our attitude. Thank you all very much.